Well, another year is in the books. And with the new year comes a great time to reflect on the past. We've made 15 videos over 2019 and covered hundreds of games, old and new. But some of the titles that we've loved this year never made it into any of the episodes. So today, we're going to fix that. Think of this like a good design, bad design episode. But they're all good design, the games all came out in 2019, and they don't have to be related to graphic design or visual communication. Welcome to the Design Doc Bonus Bag 2019, sponsored by Skillshare. As we start the new year, it's a great time to focus on self-improvement. And I know just the thing, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes on all kinds of topics. You could start the year off right by learning some of the basics of photography. You could learn how to write better lyrics, or how to play the guitar, or brush up on your typography, video editing, and character animation skills. I've been following several character animation classes from the very talented Fraser Davidson, who has some fantastic tutorials on lip syncing and rigging characters in After Effects. His techniques have saved me a ton of time. The classes are very high quality and easy to learn from, and you get access to everything, every topic, with premium membership. All for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. It's way more affordable than in-person classes and workshops. And thanks to Skillshare's sponsorship of this episode, you can start with a two-month trial for free. Click the link in the description to get two free months of premium membership and explore your creativity. Alright, let's see what's in the bonus bag. Let's pull out the first game. Here we go. Aw oh, man, it's exercise. Wait, I like this thing. I put these here. What am I saying? So, I don't like the exercise very much. It's more of a chore and an obligation. But I do like gimmicky exercise things that help take my mind off of the boredom. So I saw a Ring Fit Adventure and I was intrigued. But cautious. There have been a lot of... Xer gaming attempts over the years, and they usually fall apart in a couple of ways. Either the fitness routine is too easy, too boring, or it doesn't do enough to make itself a habit. For a lot of people, exercise sucks. You're intentionally leaving your comfort zone so you can stretch that zone a little wider, week by week. It's inherently slow going to improve your fitness too. So at the core of exercise, you have an uncomfortable, slow process that you can't work around without missing the point of why you'd exercise in the first place. But what you can do instead, and what Ring Fit Adventure does great, is to distract and simplify. Ring Fit Adventure is Nintendo's attempt to start a Wii Fit-like craze on the Switch. In an $80 package, you get the game, this leg strap, and this Pilates ring. Once you snap your two Joy-Cons into the hardware, the game can measure the ring and strap positions with the controller gyroscopes. Sensors in the ring can tell if you're squeezing or stretching it, and the IR camera can kinda check your heart rate. With those building blocks, the game can throw dozens of different exercises at you, monitor your form, and does a decent job of keeping you from cheesing your way through the exercises. That's a great start, but exercise variety and keeping players honest about doing the work is not enough by itself. To really make Ring Fit Adventure a good piece of design, Nintendo needed to do a lot more. Ring Fit Adventure's Adventure Mode is a light RPG where you're jogging in place to travel on rails through a series of stages, finding and capturing items and power-ups by pushing and pulling on the ring, and fighting through waves of enemies by doing sets of specific exercises. When I say light RPG, I mean really light. The game is a skeleton of an RPG, but it does have all the elements. Experience points? Yep. Attack and defense stats? Sure. Items to boost your stats? Check. A skill tree? It shows up extremely late, but yeah. It's just enough of a game to successfully distract you a little bit from all the exercise at the game's core. The game mechanics might be light, but Ring Fit Adventure doesn't skimp on its presentation. The adventure mode fully commits to its exercise world premise. Your sidekick is literally the Pilates ring that came with the box, and he's the only fully voiced character in the whole game for some reason. Smoothies work as health potions and stat boosts. There are mini games to play in these gyms run by these robot guys. There are exercise fetch quests and exercise boss rushes. All to save the exercise world from a dragon who's a little too into exercise. It's all pretty silly, but they commit to the dumb premise. And it somehow all works. Ring Fit Adventure's design encourages you to fight through discomfort, keep going, and push yourself a little more. The stages are usually 5 to 10 minutes long, and serve almost like workout modules. 
If you're feeling tired in the middle of one, you still feel like you have to work for another few minutes to complete a stage. The game can tell when you stop moving, and the timer in the corner stops ticking to encourage you to get going again. Within the stage, as you're watching the scenery pass by as you're jogging, or during battles when you're thinking about which attacks to use in what order, you're not as fixated about how sore your arms and legs are. The game has dozens of exercises, but simplifies your options. It only lets you bring a small handful of them to any battle, so you aren't bogged down by as many choices about what to do next. Just keep exercising. The game is also really good at adapting to your skill level. You can set an exercise intensity that changes the number of reps throughout all of the game's exercise sets. The game keeps checking in from session to session too, and will often ask if you want to make the sessions easier or more difficult. The intensity can be set extremely low for beginners, and up to a very intense workout if you want it to be. It's legit exercise. In 20 minutes you will be drenched. 30 sessions in and I'm feeling more energetic and more limber. I just feel better. And that's the whole point, right? For all the distractions and gamification steps, at its core it's a legit exercise routine. No, it doesn't have the best story, or the best graphics, or the deepest gameplay, but Ring Fit Adventure does something that's harder to find. It found a way to take something you don't want to do, but should, and makes it something you look forward to. Alright, now back to the bag. Heh, <laughs> you get most improved. The first ukulele was disappointing to a lot of people. Not that it was an awful game, but it felt half-baked. There were issues with polish and consistency throughout. Some stages were bloated and overly large, yet felt emptier than you'd expect. There was a landslide of terrible minigames. The game did stay true to the classic 3D platformers it was trying to emulate, but some of those elements had been left behind over the past 20 years for good reason. Despite the flaws, I was happy to give Platonic some slack. I enjoyed the first game, and I was excited to see what they would do next. I never expected them to shift genres in their sequel, Ukulele and the Impossible Lair. The new game traded in the Banjo-Kazooie style 3D collectathon platformer for a SNES Donkey Kong Country style 2D platformer. It makes sense in retrospect. A lot of Platonic's staff were some of the key designers on the Donkey Kong Country series. What I expected even less was that it would be one of my favorite games of the year. They modernized the core of the DKC era platformer by mixing in concepts from the past several generations of game design. The structure change is a breath of fresh air, and the number of systems that all feed into each other make it more than a nostalgic throwback. Ukulele and the Impossible Lair can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best-in-class modern platformers, like Rayman Legends and Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. Platonic took a couple pages from the Breath of the Wild playbook. At the start of the game, you're thrown into the titular Impossible Lair, an outrageously long and brutal final level, with zero checkpoints. Yeah, it's possible for you to beat it on your first try, but it's not going to happen. Once you get kicked out, the rest of the game reveals itself. There are two distinct parts to the game, the 20 main levels where all of the 2D platforming happens, and the overworld, which is a top-down 3D space focusing on exploration and puzzle solving. Each of the main platforming levels is set within a magic book, each housing a couple bee soldiers in the bee talion. As in Breath of the Wild, everything you do is technically optional, but it's all there to prepare you for the game's final challenge. Each bee you free counts as an extra hit point for the next time that you enter the impossible lair. The overworld is a hub into the main levels, but it also holds tons of secrets, open pathways, and most notably, a way to modify each of the level's magic books. When you do that, it alters the book's level in a fundamental way. Each of the 20 stages has a unique alternate version of itself that is nearly unrecognizable from the original, doubling the stage count. You might alter a stage by submerging its magic book in water, flooding the level, or by putting it near a fan, causing a windstorm to sweep over the world. Also hidden in the overworld are a ton of special game-modifying tonics. Some are cosmetic changes, like graphics filters and big head mode, while others are mechanical, that can make the game harder or easier. Some of these tonics might make enemies take an extra hit, or might give you more powerful moves. As you use these to change the difficulty of each level, you're rewarded with more or fewer quills, which act as currency. It's a lot like the system in Bastion and the other Supergiant games that can incrementally modify the feel of each level, with just a few mechanical adjustments. There are large parts of the overworld blocked off by literal paywalls. Yes, that's what they call them in-game where you pay with special twit coins that you've collected in the main levels 
to unlock the next sections of the overworld to explore. The potions can affect how fast you earn quills that you can use to buy more tonics or unlock more secrets in the overworld. All of these systems feed into each other. Finding bees in stages make your character more survivable for the impossible lair. Modified stages lead you to more bees. The overworld helps gain new stages and modify existing stages. The overworld also hides tonics that can make the game easier or more challenging, and can make you gain more money to buy more tonics and key items. Tokens unlock large parts of the world, opening even more stages. Each step in the chain is important, and it's customizable in a way that lets you take on as much risk as you want to, and progress at exactly your own pace. The systems and levels flow smoothly into each other, jumping between platforming action and Zelda-like exploration. The game becomes an excursion to add new modifiers and new techniques to your toolset that will get you the resources you'll need to fight through the game's first and last challenge. You can head back into the impossible lair at any time when you feel you're ready. This kind of self-directed progression isn't a new idea, but it's pretty uncommon, especially in platformers. Instead of the level-to-level -level grind of the SNES era platformer, that gives way to a constant decision you're making yourself. Have you yet learned enough? Did you yet unlock enough? Are you yet good enough to tackle the impossible lair? All right, one more pull from the bag. Huh, this is a big one. I'm a fair weather Fire Emblem fan. I enjoyed Path of Radiance and the first GBA game before that, and I adored Awakening back in 2013. But I didn't really feel the need to revisit the series until this year, with Fire Emblem Three Houses. It's my favorite game of the year. The changes to the series' familiar systems make for something a little bit deeper while still feeling at home in Fire Emblem. The tried and true weapon triangle was replaced with the new combat art system. It adds an extra strategic layer where burning through your weapon's durability lets you perform better attacks. Other additions like battalions and the giant monster units force a significantly different combat approach and spice up combat. The Divine Pulse, previously in Fire Emblem Echoes under a different name, simplifies how a lot of players were working around the game's permadeath by restarting missions from scratch. It lets you just rewind time and retake turns if you make a mistake. It's a safety net and a big usability improvement, while still keeping the pressure to get your entire team through a mission alive. The Persona-like calendar-based social elements build on the support systems of the previous games. Every month, you have a few free days to spend time with your units to build up their affinity, get items, increase your own abilities, recruit other house members into your team, or go out on optional missions and paralogs. The new social elements also feed into the new tutoring system, where you build up each unit's abilities like weapon proficiency, magic, and mounts, and eventually gain access to more powerful classes and benefits. The more time you spend with your students, the more motivated they will be, which lets them build up their abilities faster. The changes lead to a ton more customization and flexibility in how your team is built. But the best part, and what makes me love Three Houses the most, is how well it integrates its huge cast of characters into its long and rewarding story. There are four different campaigns to take, and they all go in significantly different directions and follow a ton of different themes. Each campaign's story is consistently high quality and very long, no matter which route you take. There's plenty of new content in each storyline that a second, third, and fourth run through the game rarely feels like retreading an old path. The game's huge extended cast is the spotlight. There are so many little character-driven subplots that interweave into the main arcs. Unlike other large cast RPGs like Chrono Cross or Suikoden, each character in Three Houses feels relevant to the story and shapes and is shaped by the story's events. The paralogues and support conversations all do a great job building up each character and make them feel important, even if they aren't central to the plot. They all feel fleshed out, and not just one no cardboard cutouts. Except for Cyril. The world of Fodland has a ton going on. The intricate political dynamics of its various factions, the dysfunctional nature of Fodland's nobility, and the many ways that it impacts the main cast and informs each of their individual arcs. Despite how different the story can be with each route, and how many expendable characters are featured, it all feels cohesive and everyone feels relevant even outside of their support conversations and paralog missions. Fire Emblem Three Houses takes a series that had been comfortable in its formula for a long time, and through some smart updates to its mechanics, narrative structure, and how it handles its large cast, keeps the series feeling fresh. And with that, we'll call it a year. 
2019 has been great for Design Doc. Thanks to all of you, our viewers, subscribers, and supporters. We reached 100,000 subscribers and got a cool plaque. We started a behind the scenes podcast over on our Patreon, hint hint, and we broke our video release record. No sense in stopping now. So from Dan and Mike, hey, thank you all for watching. Here's to a new year of Design Doc.